because I don't I don't care either way. I don't mind. Like I'm I'm either gonna go on this day or I'm just gonna keep doing what I do with my day and my career, and I love that too. And if I don't go on a day, I don't care. Yeah, because I love what I do. Yes, and, and this is the thing: busy people that have stuff going on, they they do value efficiency with dating. And as a woman, I have saved so much time and energy that I could have wasted by going on a three-hour date with someone through a five, ten-minute conversation with them. You kind of go, mm, you know, I'm not really aligning. You know, we don't have the same sense of humor. It's not really, you know, I won't get my makeup and get dressed and go and meet them and have dinner. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, it's like then you're not spending money, you know, paying for a dinner or something like that All as of well. That. Yeah. yeah. So I agree. I think you've got the right uh, mindset and attitude towards it. <laughs> it's important. You've got to be efficient. I mean. Uh, not too efficient. You know, you don't yeah. want to take the romance out of it. <laughs> no, no. I'm thinking. Mic check, Dylan Trong. How are we, my friend? Mic check. Meow. <laughs> One, two. <laughs> <laughs> the echo chamber. All yes. right. <clears throat> Welcome to another episode of Going Pro. And today we have Sarah Jeevans. You are a global coach and speaker. You're a motivational speaker and you're a social development coach who has helped thousands of people across the world to 10x their confidence with leadership and interpersonal skills to achieve more business and personal relationships. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds sexy. I Mm -hmm. like that. You were on the TV show SAS in 2021. You were a very competent tennis player. You had a tennis journey yourself, um, playing quite seriously to the age of 14. You're full of energy and life and someone that is just oozing energy. So welcome, Sarah. Thanks for being here with us today. Thank you for that beautiful intro, Luke. (laughs) Have you always been this fun, loving, high energy person? Are there any key experiences that have shaped you to have this kind of zest for life? I got asked that question not long ago, actually, and I thought about it. And I really thought, well, when can I pinpoint that energy? When did it start happening? And honestly, it was when I was a kid and I have this very vivid image of myself at home with, I don't know, we had cousins and family. There was always people around and I had this blue gymnastics mat and I remember always performing. Like it was the spot where I go, look at me, like look at me do my moves and stuff like that. So I feel like that's where it stemmed from. And also being the youngest of three kids, I was always trying to keep up with my older brother who was very athletic. So that really shaped me and my energy, I guess. Mm -hmm. You're like competing with your siblings all the time, feeling like you had to like outshine them or find a way to get attention from your parents in a way. Yeah, I feel like, is that a similar experience that you had growing up? Oh, very, like quite a few things have shaped me to get to where I am. I'm actually the oldest. I've only got one sibling. Uh, We're close in age. But um, yeah, definitely, I would say a bit of a journey to get to where I am to kind of build the confidence and charisma Mm. that I feel that comes more naturally that maybe wasn't natural at the start. But Mm. when you go on a journey of self-discovery to actually kind of find out who you are, then you can become a little bit more comfortable and be just confident to share who you are with the world without feeling like, ah, like I'm too insecure to be who I am and all of that sort of jazz. Yeah, when you learn that expressing yourself gives permission to others to be themselves, that's where I really found the power. Mm -hmm. I was like, the more that I can meow like a cat or do silly things that are me, the more that others actually relax. And I've just double down on that throughout my career throughout everything I do and it really does help so how long have you been really kind of like doubling down on that because I feel once you do do that you create a space to make people feel so much more comfortable Mm. to give them that feeling like you said just to be like hang on a minute this person's being a little bit ridiculous I can be (laughs) ridiculous too exactly that's what my clients always say they're like thank you Sarah for like just letting me be me um I'd say doubling down my goodness I reckon taking it like seriously would be in my early 20s uh my teenage years were turbulent it was like a fight I feel like it was a tug of war with my emotions and trying to figure out who I was uh especially growing up in Adelaide just yeah just in what way you know just uh battling with you know my career in tennis getting injured which we might go into as well but Uh, Then going down the route of socializing, the binge drinking culture in Australia, doing drugs, like all of this stuff. If you get sucked into that uh, space, you either don't come out or you get spat out the other end where you have to pick up the pieces and kind of go, 
all right, well, who do you want to be in this world? And I feel like that's definitely what happened to me. And I really doubled down after that. Yeah. When I- what helped you kind of make that shift? Because I feel like I made a, a, a also a similar shift, but I went overseas to really figure all of that out for almost a year to then come back and go, yeah, no, nah, I'm, I'm doubling down on, mm. on, on this and going down this path and, and maybe make people – people might judge me for being that way because especially in Adelaide when it's mm. so conservative here, you can stand out. Like I feel like I wouldn't stand out so much in Melbourne. Um, but here I feel like just from expressing myself in this way, people look at me and go like, wow, like that's really interesting and different. So mm. were there like some key things that you did – from that kind of teenage years mm-hmm. to early 20s that actually started to catapult you to feel comfortable in that way? Yeah, I feel like there's a couple of moments. One, when I went to live in Italy for three months, like a student exchange, that was big because I felt very alone, couldn't speak Italian, big mistake, don't go to Italy if you cannot speak any Italian. Uh, and then I feel like when I got into my acting, I was quite young and that really shaped me as well. And then recently i did a similar thing luke i went through a a nasty breakup and ended up in los angeles i mean where else would you go right and that's where i found myself again and realized wow okay you're powerful sarah like lean into this side of yourself and i've been on that journey ever since Mm. i made that trip in 2018. Mm, wow powerful stuff there's something about travel that Mm. really opens up those doors to just get away from the noise and get away from the bubble of just the familiar and what you know, the people you're around to actually start to have that outsider's view of what's yeah. going on. Like what was, what did you start to realize when you took yourself out of the Adelaide bubble and like after a breakup, for example, to see where you were kind of missing the mark or things about yourself that you maybe didn't like? Yeah. The magical thing that I experienced overseas was the opportunities they're everywhere and i'm not sure if you've been to la and you got have gotten into the networking scene there there is like seven or eight events every night that you could go to so just as much as you could immerse yourself in i see why people would also hate la they're either like oh i love it or i hate it for me i really thrived off of the fact that there is so many opportunities to network to go to different things and to figure out what it is that i like And that's how I got into the dating industry in the first place. Mm -hmm. I was just going to all these different events and talking to super interesting people with amazing stories. And then I found this one opening where I was like, that, I'm doing that. Yeah. (laughs) What was that opening? I was sitting down on a balcony, I remember, at someone's birthday at a penthouse in LA. It was just the most random thing. You know, you always got into these wild conversations with people. And it was the CEO of this global dating company called Real Social Dynamics, which really built its whole community teaching pickup artists. So they were pickup artists teaching men how to pick up women. And I'd briefly been exposed to it through an ex-partner. And then to be sitting there with the creators of it, I was like, ooh, like this is juicy. And as a woman learning about that space, you're like, well, there's something that just kind of pulls you in to want to find out what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I liked the challenge of it. So, yeah, it was that moment where he offered me this position to do a world tour with him. Wow. And I was like, yeah, why not? 21-year-old Sarah was like, yep, I got nothing else I'm doing. Let's do it. 21 years old <laughs> and opportunities presenting themselves like that, just going for it. Yep. That would have been crazy times. Would have felt was. like a dream. It, it, did, it does. Even just <laughs> reflecting about it, I'm like, whoa. You know, I remember he showed me this Excel spreadsheet of the next two years of my life and it was all mapped out, like every single city that I was going to fly to and it was just Groundhog's Day. Like it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's pretty wild just looking at that That's spreadsheet. Wild. Man, oh, there's a <laughs> rabbit hole I want to dive into right now, but I'm going to hold my, I'm going to shackle myself back here just for a moment because, yeah, we're, we're going to get stuck into that because I really want to get into the whole dating game. Yep. I'm intrigued to pick your brains on that side of things. But before we do, I really want to tap into um, the acting side because you did say before mm. you got into acting that shaped you. 
Today's podcast sponsor is Electric Road Agency, who were formerly 4RT. Now, if you want a team of strategists, designers, producers, creators who drive stories to tell your advertising and marketing needs, these guys are the best in the business. They've been extremely influential for us at ATA. They've driven our media game forward to new levels that we never knew that were possible. And they've done it with countless brands, big, small. It doesn't matter what the size. They just love telling your story. So they specialize in health, wellness, fitness, tourism, construction, and they are just the best in the business in creating adaptive solutions to find how to tell your brand or how to discover your brand and tell that story. So highly, highly, highly recommend these guys. And if you want to get in touch, please go on electricroad.au or search the Instagram handle Electric Road Agency and they will answer your email, your call, your DM, and they'll be in touch and they'll be able to tell your story very well. That shaped you. What age did you get into that and how did that start? And then how did things change for you once you did start getting into acting? I was 13 years old. I remember one of my dad's girlfriends actually got me into it. She got me into modeling. I remember doing that and acting all at the same time. So went to Ann Peters, who's a okay. lovely, yeah. you know, Ann Peters? I've heard of Ann Peters, yes. Heard of, <laughs> what have you heard? Um, <laughs> so she was my teacher for three years and she definitely shapes you. I mean, you have lots of teachers when you work with her. However, Ann is a very unique personality. She's really tough on you. I've seen people cry and walk out of classes with her and never come back. And she's told me point blank that that was shit after I performed a scene. And that kind of tough love either breaks your belief or it strengthen, strengthens you. And I really felt like that was the beginning of strengthening me and my courage and my belief in myself. And I still chat with her, you know, and I still do auditions and things like that. It's not my main thing. But going through those three years of intense training was so much more than just acting. And I've learned through networking and through running my own business that, you know, the, the skills to be able to not just perform or to be able to lean into different parts of yourself and utilize the power of emotions, mm -hmm. that's really what acting gave me. And now I use that in all areas of my life. Like every day of my life, I'm acting. For sure. I mean, I feel so many people would actually benefit from doing acting. And I feel like it should actually be taught in schools because we all wear masks. We all yep. wear masks and we're all kind of like shades of ourselves, but we're not actually aware of how we're actually putting those masks on. And if we can actually become aware and consciously act and perform in a way and do it consciously, that could be the game changer. And you can learn amazing tools from from acting that have actually like, um, yeah, kind of help you in certain situations, social situations, kind of get mm -hmm. what you want and mm -hmm. it'll influence people, but not in a manipulative way, but also just a way that it's going to help you get to where you want to go, but then also help other people too. So what sort of tools and what sort of things did you actually learn from these three years with Ann Peters? There's a lot. I could, I could really go down some serious rabbit holes. I do feel like the emotional diversity of how I can show up is something I took from the classes. Uh, what you were just touching on there just makes me think of developing social confidence. That's what it does, these tools. And I always recommend it to my clients. It's like if you're not confident or comfortable making new friends or going out and socializing, especially in dating, mm -hmm. then go and do an improv class. So what improv really allows you to do, and this is one of the tools that you learn, is to think on your feet. Think quick, adapt to the moment and be able to not get frazzled and freeze, but actually have something you know on the tip of your tongue that you can add to the conversation uh, so you can feel comfortable and you don't like freeze or run away from the situation. Dying art. So yeah. many people suck <laughs> at that. And just by doing that and just doing a few acting classes, I feel like it puts you in the top 10% of just communicators. Yeah. Just being able to communicate, think quick on your feet is a game changer. I mean, mm. I, I didn't do acting. I've done a little bit of kind of acting exercises through some um, personal development stuff that I've done. But I have done Toastmasters, which is public oh, speaking. It's brilliant, isn't it? For, I did that for three years and that was a game changer just yeah. to feel confident, understand simple cues around just like gestures, pause, tone. Yes. And just actually know how to do that and have a space to develop my confidence and ability to do that in a space mm. consistently each week. So that, that was a game changer and highly recommend anyone 
do that because in a world of technology where AI is going to take over in some capacity, if you can if you can communicate, you're going to be sweet. Yeah. You're going to be sweet in this life. So it's a game changer. I only recently tried Toastmasters. Yeah. I was always like, oh, it just seems so old school. Like, I feel, does, does everyone have that experience? I don't know. But I was like, mm, like all the resistance was coming up. And a friend of mine uh, in a business group that I'm in, he he does it like religiously and I thought all right I'll go and do it and it's pretty mind-blowing like their structures really do help you build confidence and become a powerful speaker you really know how to use your instrument which is your voice and your body language and everything like that yeah it's it's massive um highly recommend to anyone so where did that lead so you did acting was that like a massive passion of yours and where did that lead for you in the next years ahead Mm, I feel like as a kid I tried a lot of things Played a lot of sport, loved acting, loved performing. I did a couple of films. Uh, My first one was a horror film called Inner Demon with Ursula Dabrowski and that was a lot of fun, a lot of late nights, a lot of uh, terrifying nightmares afterwards. I think I kept waking up at 3 a.m. every night for like three months after filming that. Uh, But it was a great experience to be on set with like a full crew and to just go through that whole process of creating a film and then after that the film got into different festivals so actually being able to go on that tour you know going to Germany for the Berlin Ali Film Festival going to Sitges which is an international film festival in Spain and then you know around Australia as well I just learned so much about the business of acting or the business of making films and things like that as well so I really enjoyed those experiences that's amazing that would have yeah just to be able to go around the world and yeah. have those experiences and learn kind of the business side of acting what happens in film would have been awesome for you how did this lead into SAS this has been on the just the tip of my tongue I saw you on the show I um I was tracking it through your social media and it looked sick. So how did this come about? And let's dive in. How was that experience? The SAS experience. Well, I recently did a post reflecting about that and I was sitting up in bed at 10.30 at night and something just popped up about SAS and I'd seen the first season and I thought it was brilliant. And again, that, that part of my personality that loves challenges and like, oh, you know, I wonder how I would go on something like that. I just really wanted to find out. So it all happened pretty quick for me. I applied for it the next day. I think someone rang me and then it was two and a half weeks and I was on the show. So I was kind of scrambling. I hired like two different personal trainers, ex-military. I was like, I need help. I know nothing about the military. Like what the fuck have I gotten myself into? Like the anxiety was at an all-time high. Yeah. You know, I was training down at uh, where were we? Port Nalunga, like yeah. in the water at 5.30 in the morning. It's pitch black. I'm doing squats in the waves. I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah, so it was a roller coaster from the very start. Wow. Okay. So then what happened once you're on the show? Mm. Like how was your experience? Because I didn't get to watch much of it. So, And you obviously you wouldn't know what happens behind the scenes. So how was like the show actually run and, and yeah. how was and how tough was the show in itself? Yeah, it was terrifying. I'm surprised I actually didn't pee my pants in the first four hours when we were on the bus. So you get there, you're isolated in your own little motel room and you've got no access to, you know, anything really. You don't talk to the other recruits until right before you go on the bus, which on this particular season, that's how it started for us. We were all on a bus heading on some road, the production team, you know, confuses you and says oh we we, we're not starting until another hour or something you know and I'm thinking oh that's okay I've got my leggings on and my track pants I'm I'm really hot I'll take them off before we start the show and then next minute you hear this like helicopter hovering above the bus everyone's screaming being like oh you know and then you just see you know all of the the DS like coming out of the, the helicopter down their ropes and we're just freaking out and you know you think oh this is a show like how cool this is gonna be fun when like Ant and, and Foxy and that all get in there, they are dead serious. Like they grab grab you by the scruff of your neck, like, you know, throwing people on the ground, dragging you off the bus, smashing you onto the bitumen on the side of the road. And that's when your heart drops and you go, this is real. No one, there is no production team getting involved. Like they are told to say nothing to us. 
So you kind of have that sinking feeling where you're like, oh, like, this is not just reality TV. Like I'm <laughs> having a full SAS experience right now. Yeah. So it was a bit scary. You're kind of like, damn, this is so cool. You know, and Middleton's yelling at me, but you're also freaking out a little bit as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so what, what, what happened? Like what sort of tasks did you have to do and how long were you on the show? Yeah. So the first day was actually, I'd say, one of the most terrifying for me. Mm-hmm. Um. So once they get you on the bitumen, they hood you up, black hood, you can't see anything at all. And then you just like, you know, one foot in front of the other, uh, whoever's in front of you. Anyway, this whole thing was about three hours. So they put you in the back of this little car and you just, it feels like an eternity before we got to the very first challenge of the whole show on day one. And it was the one that I just said, please, let's not do that one. I don't want to do that one. Anything but that one. And I remember Aunt ripping off my um, my black hood and all I could see was him directly in front of me and just water surrounding us. And we were on this platform that had been taken out into the middle of a crater, like a, a big lake mm-hmm. crater or something. And the very first exercise was to see if you could follow basic instruction. And And it just says you're going to put one hand across your chest, the other one across, and then you're just going to fall back. Don't jump back. You just fall back like a board. Do not bend. And that was the most terrifying exercise from the show, to be honest with you. And you can't, like in my head, I'm like, I can't not do the first one. Everyone else has done it. I was like one of the last people to go. And um, you just got to trust at that moment. And it was about, I don't know, 15, 20 meters up. And you just got to fall back, boom, and hit the water head first. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know about you, as a kid, whether you had those holidays, we, we would always go to Second Valley and jump off the jetty. Yeah. I remember standing up there for an hour or longer being like, oh, I don't want to jump. And that was jumping forward feet first. This is 20 meters up, going head first, backwards. So that was definitely the the scariest start and probably one of the scariest exercises for me personally to get through. Wow. So how long were you actually on the show? So I got all the way to the end. I actually, I passed um, with another guy called James. Mm -hmm, He's mm -hmm. a dancer, really cool guy. So yeah, there was four of us that made it through the course and then there was two of us that were chosen by the, the DS to have officially passed the course. So you can get through it, but you may not pass, if that makes sense, at the end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was in shock. I was like, what the fuck? Because I I thought on the day they trick you as well. Like this is the cool thing about the show. Every time you're doing a challenge, they tell you one thing, like here are the instructions, but really they're looking for something completely different. And that is what's so incredible about their coaching. And I call it coaching because as much as on TV they appear as like these scary DS that are yelling at you. To me, the experience is kind of like Tony Robin, uh, Tony Robbins on steroids. Like a, it's like going there and actually physically going through all of these challenges and then learning afterwards, that wasn't a race. That was to see whether you could stay calm and collected to get through it to survive. Because in the real SAS, what are you going to do? Race your buddy across a canyon? You know, I just remember that one exercise we had to get across and it's like, hey, Sarah, you're against Luke or something. You've got to beat him across. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, okay, but if I rush, I might fall off. And mm. lots of recruits did. So I didn't win that, but I made it across and didn't die. So that's in their eyes, it's like, cool, They she stayed yeah. level-headed. Level-headed to actually understand the magnitude of that situation yeah. and weigh multiple things up and to actually make a clear decision mm. on what you need to do. And that's the show. They're looking for a thinking soldier. They're not looking for the strongest soldier. Mm-hmm. They're looking for someone who can think. And that's what I really took away from it was, okay, it's not just about your strengths and weaknesses. It's about how you adapt. And then it's also about teamwork was the other huge lesson I took from that too Mm -hmm. yeah well you're nothing if you if you can't work with others you can Mm. be as strong as as you as you want by yourself but if you can't actually apply that and work with other people then it really doesn't mean anything yeah yeah so what 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 came up for you mentally like in that it sounds horrific and challenging you would have had I mean I know just from pushing myself recently in some real physical feats Mm. like the mental things that come up that you just those screaming thoughts of stop and this and 
all all the thoughts and and things that come up, I can imagine it would have been full on for you. So what sort of things were coming up for you mentally while going through that sort of experience? The self doubt was brutal. The the thoughts are every as every day went on, you'd think, when am I going to pull out? Like, when's that moment going to be for me where I just go, no, nah, I can't keep going? And you have multiple thoughts like that. Well, I definitely did, and. Yeah, that the doubt or, do, you know, do I deserve to be here? You start to have all of these stories come up to the surface. And I remember one night we were being beasted and... What's beasted, sorry? Beasted. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so they, they call them... Be- Are they called beastings? Yeah, they are. Um, They would pretty much take you to the parade square where you're supposed to line up. So it's pretty much just a square where that, you know, the DS are on a platform yelling at you um, and you've got to do really brutal workouts that have no end to them. Okay. Yeah, so that you just keep getting beaten and beaten and there's like no end. And sometimes it'll be 1 a.m. in the morning and they just pull you out of bed and, and down you go to do some brutal exercise that may never end. And again, I think it was day one, there was one of the worst. And that was the initial day, like you, you're dragging yourself around this square with all of these tiny slated, like edged rocks. I don't even know how to describe them, but they were like just serrating everybody's elbows. You know, you're like all bloody by the end of it. And you're like, this is like, how much of this can we take? Uh, so that's a bee sting. Um, and they would always yeah, change from day to day. Yeah, okay. So how did you overcome that self-doubt like, and just keep going? Was it just basically as simple as, no, nah, I just got to keep on going. I just got to keep – I can't stop. I got to keep on going. It, pretty much, yeah. That was – the night that I was getting to then, it was like there was these monkey bars. And, you know, when you're 12 years old, the monkey bars are easy, right? They're so much fun. But for some reason, they are, are a weakness for me. I just slip off them, kept slipping off them. Uh, and all I could do was keep trying, like go back to the start – try again and you're getting yelled at you're a piece of shit this is pathetic like you know what a disgrace you're just getting all of this like thrown at you so that was my worst night and I remember them pulling in to interrogate me about that and (laughs) that night when they interrogated me and banged on the table and said you know that doesn't matter like it was like a wake-up call it's like none of that matters Sarah none of it It's not about whether you can't do something. It's all about you just continuing to do it. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't start dropping your shoulders or hanging your head. Like all that behavior, it was like just fucking focus. Now is the time to focus. So that was a a big lesson I took from it. That's that's, that's so good. And I love hearing that because uh, that ties into what we're trying to talk about with some of the kids because with the kids we work with on the tennis court, sorry, just a little sidetrack here, but – so many of them are just dropping their head. One little, mm. one little obstacle when they start missing some shots and losing their way, and it's just like drop of the shoulders. I can't do this. I'm not good enough. Rather than just like get focused, keep going, don't stop. Yes. Do you know what? That reminds me of when I was playing tennis as a kid, though, because it's it's a strange experience. You want to do well, and if your brain thinks that missing a shot or messing up is not good, then that equals negative rather than keeping your head up and just moving forward. So it is something you've, you've got to learn and through repetition. For sure. I mean, uh, just kids aren't being exposed. I think things have gotten a little bit more just cozy and comfy. Mm. That We're not really exposed to these sort of experiences as much. Uh, and just for you to do that would have been completely eye-opening because I feel like you're already good in that way where you can actually handle challenge and adversity but that would have just like turned the dial to 100 i think some of my biggest fans were the kids i remember playing tennis down at uh, henley primary school and all the kids would be like oh sarah like you know they're cheering as i was playing tennis and recruit number five like you know they loved it and they want you to even treat them like recruits i, I don't know it must have been at the tennis courts and there were some kids playing and they they want you to yell at them right and say come here don't do that and they go like cheeky laughs and all of that so it may work quite well to implement a little bit of sas training on the court for them oh we do it in our little way yeah a little bit of tough love delivered in the right way doesn't yes. hurt yeah it, it needs there is a push and a pull in yep. that way and it needs to be delivered with care and thought yep. and at the right time with the right person mm. um 
so yeah that has to be taken in consideration but yeah tough love is important and i think we need to come back to that a little bit more for sure definitely yeah Mm. i i feel like i didn't get that a lot in my experience with tennis as Mm. a kid and yeah so exactly what you said it needs to be done in the right way coming from a place of love which i feel like all the guys on sas do extremely well yeah awesome so post that show so after the show what you would have had some time to reflect. What did you really learn? How did you change as a person from an experience like that? The biggest shift is that even when you feel like crap and you start doubting yourself, it's just to remind yourself that one, you got through that and it's a pretty big milestone. I want to say like I'll remember that for my entire life to have gone through that. So it gives you a sense of strength to go just to keep going that's the courage like sarah you did that you fell backwards you jumped out of helicopters you got absolutely beaten down and you still kept going so Mm. i feel like i'm a lot more resilient after going through that show game changer things don't phase you as much i'm guessing now just like something happens you're like eh, whatever like i jumped off of an airplane like (laughs) i fell back 20 meters with 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 my head like into some water like what's this it's not even a deal yeah exactly yeah yeah i think that's yeah that's a game changer for you to actually feel like the little things aren't so little or they're not you don't don't get phased by them so much anymore Mm, yeah i think i'm far more interested now in the emotional side of things because regardless of being a resilient person, you're still human. And I feel like I'm learning a lot about that even just through running my own business. And you're still going to have moments where whether it's doubt or whether it's frustration or whether it's unresolved things from your childhood, which we all have, you're suddenly like, wow, you're dealing with these big, big emotions that didn't get the love that they needed Mm -hmm. uh, years ago. So now I'm just a lot more aware of that. And how has that shifted? Well, How have you now shifted into that gear a little bit more post this experience? I feel like you learn a lot about your emotions on that show. Uh, and my whole life I've been fascinated by human behavior and emotions and what is their purpose and why do we experience these emotions? What are they here to teach us? So I feel like what's sw- uh, switched gears is my not just my awareness. I feel like I've had a pretty good awareness of it, but actually now finding solutions And you hear a lot of people talk about healing, like your childhood trauma or like your emotions. And I understand that. Um, But is it about healing it or is it really about understanding the emotions and how you can find solutions or work through it and find what the lessons are for each of those experiences? And they might, it might not be that you heal and they never come up. They're going to come up throughout your life. So it's kind of like how you approach those challenges emotionally. Yeah, that's really refreshing to hear actually because, yeah, in that kind of self-help spiritual space, it can be really a little bit woo-woo in a sense of I think it's a beautiful movement, but it can be a little bit not bound by anything practical yeah. and not bound by any actual solutions. It's like childhood trauma, let's feel into it, like it's okay, but then what are you going to do about it? Exactly. Like, what, what's the next step? What's the so- solution? What's the tools you're going to do mm. and how can we actually move past that which happened which is that that's not um, that's not great that that happened but Mm. you can't change it so how do you maybe reprogram it perspective shift on it tell a different story around it and actually move on in the world and not be crippled by it for the rest of your life so what sort of things do you help people with so i want want to tie back into and get really stuck into what you do Uh as, as a coach in the dating game so for you, how did you get into the space and what sort of things do you help people with in mm-hmm. everything we've just touched on? Yeah, juicy topic. So as I said before, uh, the invitation to do a world tour with the old company I work for, that's how I got into it. So I didn't, you know, I didn't get the training, let's just say. If, if, if anything, it was kind of like SAS, right? I had two weeks of training uh, in LA. I did my first event there with the crew and then I was sent on a plane back to Australia with my camera, all my gear, everything like that and then everything started from that point. So I ran my first event in Brisbane, then I went to Sydney, then I went to Melbourne, then I went to Perth, then I went over to Europe, all just, around just like Europe, that. Just, boom, like that. just like that. 
What do you mean? Like I'm talking dropped in the middle of the ocean and you're either going to sink what or swim. What are you talking about? Yeah. How is that even possible? So I know. I'm how, like, are these you... guys crazy? They're just sending like some random chick they just met and they're putting all this trust in her to go and run these events. It was wild. So what were you teaching and how was it at that early point when you really <laughs> didn't know much about anything at that point in this game? I was scared shitless. You're in a room full of horny guys. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> And you're the only girl. You're like, geez, this could end really badly or <laughs> really great. Uh, at the beginning, <clears throat> at the beginning, I would like this sounds wild to me when I when I think back about it. But I'd go to like a, it'd be a hotel room or like a seminar room or sometimes just the Airbnb I was staying in. Like there were times, yeah, where I'd have like fifty men all up, you know, from different. 15 years old to like over 50, all crammed into this tiny little room. Like the one we're in here, I remember in Sweden, I had like a room like this and I'm trying to cram all these guys in to listen to me talk for four hours and then sell them on a package to come out to the streets and bars and clubs to approach women over the next two days. Okay, wow. Yeah, so that was, it didn't start that way. At the beginning, I had a projector, a big projector in my big backpack that I traveled around with and I'd I projected onto the wall and I would really use the authority of the other coaches to build, I guess, the respect with the <clears throat> respect with the guys because they put a lot of these coaches on like rock star level. Like these guys are like the pickup artists, you know, that they're the best of the best in the world. Um, <clears throat> and RSD Papa, uh, that was his name. He was, yeah, one of the, I guess, OGs of this community. So mm -hmm. I would project him up on the wall and he'd do like his presentation for an hour or so. And then I would just jump in and, and ah, talk. Okay, I and, see. Yeah, yeah and yeah. so eventually uh, he said to me, Sarah, you can just do it by yourself. Yeah. yeah, so you had kind of like informal training and had like him as a guide without him being there that you can kind of like piggyback off. Yeah, yeah. I was really, really grateful. I feel like he's one of the best mentors I've ever had. In, mm. I don't know whether he realized that or not, like if he was consciously or unconsciously training me, uh, but it definitely had a, a really great effect on my confidence, mm -hmm. being able to get in front of groups of strangers and not just talk to them about dating and relationships, but sell them. Like yeah. Selling from stage is a whole art form in an in and of itself and I again didn't really get any training except for watching other people do it or watching him do it mm -hmm. yeah there's nothing like just being thrown in the deep end like that just to learn <laughs> I love it sink or swim <laughs> some people thrive on it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah as you get to a certain age though you go and oh I think I need things a little bit more structured yeah but when you're young it's just absolutely let's just go all in let's let's just see how I go and and you you back yourself but yeah, I think people like yourself, it's just you know that you're going to be sweet if you get thrown into situations and you're adaptable enough just to kind of find a way, which is which is important. What sort of things were you actually teaching? Was it was it purely like at the pickup <clears throat> game around at, at that point before it started evolving into the business and you being like a dating coach that you are now? Yeah, definitely. I felt like I was wanting to gain respect as a woman in their space and it – you know, it's pretty. It's a pretty powerful community. Like a lot of men, when they're coming of age and they're suddenly looking at women and like, oh, hmm, I might be interested in them. There really isn't anywhere to go for them to learn these skills, and that's what this community, a global community, provided for men was a safe place where they could learn from other men how to build confidence with women. Huge. Like just, you know, you can see how it just took off. And at the beginning it was all these like Reddit forums and things like that. It was very like on the sly. So for me, my approach was I've got to teach them what they're already really interested in. They're in this room because they've been, you know, drawn in by what they're already coaching and what they're teaching. So at the beginning I was definitely like guns blazing with their technique. Some of them a little more manipulating than others yeah. if i'm being completely honest yeah so i mean i don't know heaps about the pickup culture i know a little bit about it yeah it gets a bit of a bad rap mm. as a like real a bit sleazy a bit manipulative yep. like you said but how would you describe what the pickup culture actually is and and, and what's the what's i guess like the 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 nice or the good things about the pickup culture that maybe people don't really realize yeah, I feel like there's a lot more good than there is bad 
Whereas when you're on the outside, it seems the opposite. It seems like, oh, look at these manipulative men that are like tricking women into sleeping with them. Uh, So as a woman that went behind the scenes, I saw some things that I probably didn't agree with completely, like filming people without them knowing, uh, which was called in-field footage. And it was a way for guys to learn through watching their coaches or their fellow teammates go out and execute something like physically escalating and and making out with a girl and then they can watch it back to see that it's real. Um, (laughs) Why? (laughs) Why? Because a lot of them don't. They're like, oh, you can't really do that. Show us. Like they want to see the. I need proof. I need proof. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So that was that sort of stuff I felt a bit icky about. Yeah. And when a woman looks at you and goes, why are you filming? And you don't know what to say. It's a really really uncomfortable experience. And in the early days, like it was an event I ran in San Diego and because I knew the value of the infield footage, uh, there was a moment where one of my students reenacted that scene from Dirty Dancing. With, you know, the Patrick, yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. a girl runs up and he lifts her up. And I was like, damn, that's good. And then, like, she comes down and they have this romantic kiss. And so I, like, called my camera dude. And I was like, you got to come back to this bar. you got to come back to the bar. We need to recreate this whole thing that just played out because it was ridiculous so then i've gotten my camera guy to come back i've gotten this student to reenact what he just did with that girl and just to get it on infield footage i was like why like looking back i'm like what the hell is my life why am i doing this like why is it i've got to get it on film yeah um so when we removed that it was such a relief because it caused a lot of pressure for me Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. uh, i've got to like get these moments, three-way makeouts, and I'm like, well, this is like cringeworthy because the biggest realisation was this is not, this will not help these men in the long run. Awesome, you had a wild weekend with Sarah, you made out with some people, now go back to your day-to-day life and recreate this. And so the good about this industry is the fact that the things that are really stopping guys from having success with women are a lot deeper and more to do with themselves than going out and having a great night randomly. It's, it's like when you can really face those inner demons, bring them to the surface, acknowledge them, let them go, and then go out, you know, socializing, meeting people and really acting from your authentic self, you always get more success. That's what women really find attractive. So as I, I continued on this, this journey doing these shows, my seminars started to get more and more intense emotionally. It was like four-day seminars where we'd be bringing up all these emotions. And again, upon reflection, probably wasn't qualified to be doing that, to be honest with you. And again, I'm like, I can own that now. I was young, but I just saw logically that this is what these guys needed. And so I just started to uh, integrate that into the workshops. Like, let's do this first then we'll go have the fun and go out. Yeah. No, I respect the fact that you're honest about that. But at the time, sometimes you just got to go in. And if you see a gap or see that there's something missing and you feel like, oh, I need to do something, then mm. sometimes you just got to do it. These are great things are, are built. Like mm. inventions are created not, that they didn't exist before and people had this idea and then they just just went for it. Not gonna wait for some like magical thing to like. Oh, now I got now I got four pieces of paper on the wall. Now I'm qualified to tell people <laughs> that I can do this and you can do that. Yeah. So like I, I hear you. Um. Mm. And yeah, it is important to actually be qualified yep. and learn and find the right timing of when to integrate and when to teach people things. But sometimes you just got to go. Yeah. And if you saw that <laughs> hole in in that that's what that space needed, then that actually would have been really beneficial. I'm sure you would have had massive breakthrough experiences oh, with some of these guys. It's like incredible. You, you actually, yeah, you've got no idea. And again, now knowing what I know now, uh, I always recommend clients either have a therapist or somebody who is like trained in those areas to safely take them through because it's not a magic pill. It's not going to happen in an exercise over over one or two nights, right? Um, but what I really noticed is these men reclaiming themselves. It was just spine tingling some of the things that would happen in the seminar room, like the tears of the these men that have been through some really 
tough times. Like I remember one client so vividly just breaking down in front of an entire room full of men and sharing about what it was like growing up in Syria, hearing bombs going off and like having your friends, you know, show up dead on on this Facebook group. Like it was spine tingling, like to be a part of somebody finally speaking out on something like that, um, you know, to, I remember this other guy just like punching the ground until his knuckles bled. And it was like this relief, like relieving of this anger and this rage that he had. And I never felt unsafe, to be honest with you. And it seems strange, like being around those big emotions with these fully grown men, but I never felt like that. It was always a really safe environment. And it was just, we're all here to support each other. And you would not, you would see these, you know, hundreds of guys sometimes just getting around another guy and just like being there for him and holding space and letting him feel emotions that he's shut down and suppressed since he was a kid. So that was really the magic that I was like, ooh. Mm. Powerful. That would have been epic. Yeah. Yeah, and just to just hear some of those stories because um, I think we often forget that we are, so, we are a lot more similar than what we are different and people are going through their own struggles and battles in mm. so many different ways and you just don't know what people experience it just to be able to hold space for someone to – let that all out yep. and be part of their journey of healing is um is really special and the fact that you didn't feel daunted by that or didn't feel unsafe is a sign that you're in the right space doing your life's work really yeah so from those experiences i'm guessing it would have really then mm, transitioned you into your own dating business that is centered around having and these sort of experiences and helping clients one-on-one so how did you transition from these sort of seminars into doing your own thing with everything that you'd learned up until that point? Yeah, it was really scary if I'm being honest again. <clears throat> uh, being the only female coach in this company that was going through some big changes, you know, it's a, it was, it was 10 coaches or something like that at the time and a new CEO, so the old one that I originally started with, he'd moved on, there was someone new. So there was a lot of big changes And I remember sitting down having a meeting with all the execs and they were like paving out my future in the company. And I remember really tuning into my gut and being like, I don't see myself doing what they're telling me right now. I don't see that future here. Uh, It doesn't feel right. And it was really scary because I remember being, Israel was one of the last places I ran an event and it was close to Christmas and I always came back to Adelaide for Christmas to spend time with my family and I had a phone call with the CEO at the time, the new one, <clears throat> and I just said, look, after this, I'm not going to be doing any any more coaching with you guys and it was terrifying. <laughs> it, was, it was just like, is there anything we can do or say to change that? And I remember taking a breath and I was like, no. <laughs> and it was, I just read that book. Um, what's it called? Never Split the Difference. Have you ever read that no, book? I haven't read that book. Uh, do you know the book? Yeah, it's, um, oh, I've got the author's name. He's ex FBI and he would do all of the negotiations okay, yeah, for yeah. Uh, hostage negotiations. Wow. Yep. Yep. And I just remember be silent, Sarah in certain moments. So that really helped me get through that decision-making to leave the company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it wasn't like the best experience leaving. It was kind of like a bad breakup, which surprised me because, you know, I've been working with these gurus in dating and relationships and being able to have a a good separation is an important skill just as much as getting into relationships. So I thought it was quite interesting just looking back being like, you know, they really struggled to have a healthy separation because they had some pretty bad experiences in the past with other people leaving the company. Yeah, not practicing what they preach, unfortunately. <clears throat> mm. um, so going back into the dating game, what do you observe with men? What is the most common or what are common things that you see a lot of guys struggling with? Yeah, so I've chosen to niche down and focus on a certain area because of what I've noticed with what most guys struggle with. And if we take an avatar that often gets friend zoned, which is a classic uh, 
common thing that happens for a lot of guys is they don't know how to get out of the friend zone or they always get stuck and get put in that box of, I mean, you're a great guy, but uh, like I don't see you in a romantic way. <laughs> it's the most heart-wrenching thing for you to hear from like your female friends. You're like, great. Mm. <sighs> That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking <laughs> yeah. about. That used to be me back in the day. <laughs> I was the friend zone nice guy and I had to weasel my way out of that friend zone but found a way. Oh, what was your way, Luke? <laughs> oh, just authenticity and being really mm. confident and comfortable with yourself and actually just asking the question, like putting yourself out there and just trying to close go. and just what's the worst that can happen? Like yep. the, uh, I'm getting friend zoned anyway. So you just try to close the door make the next move yep. and it either works or it doesn't work and then you move on. The fear is sometimes too much for a lot of guys, just the thought of being rejected. And again, that links to a lot more than just externally someone rejecting you. What is that really tied to? So I love that answer though, just being authentic, building up the confidence and the courage really to just ask because one of the biggest problems that I noticed is most men just do not clearly let a woman know what their intentions are. It's so yeah. simple, but it's really hard when you practice it. And that's why a big part of what I do is provide safe uh, safe spaces for men to practice that kind of behavior and the communication of flirting. Mm. Mm. Yeah, let's break that down a little bit more because a lot of people struggle with that. So how do you actually do that? Yeah, so when I was traveling, I would do live role plays. And again, this is where I really could – pull from my acting background mm -hmm. and recreate these experiences so guys could approach me, you know, in the seminar room in front of their peers and then their peers can give them feedback and go, you know, hey, man, like I'm just noticing, you know, you're coming from behind that, that comes across a bit scary or whatever, yeah. you know, like just little things like that. It's or, all those details that yeah, add up, yeah. Yeah. Um, the subconscious language. Exactly. And so the way that I implement that in my business now is by having a team of incredible women who are passionate about you know, human behavior and just wanting to help men and also learn themselves. And they are part of my dream girls team. So my clients will book dates with them. And so they sim it's, it's like a simulated first date virtually. So you got interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Got, that's it a is. cool idea. It's, it's really it's it's really amazing. I've seen like the best results because what's cool about it, kind of like let's say in sales, if you wanted to practice your sales calls, you would record them and show your mentor mm -hmm. and go, hey, like what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? How can I improve this? Like everyone's just I've got all these money objections or they say, oh, not right now. It's the same with dating in a way, because now we can watch the tape back and go, well, you didn't flirt with her at all. Like, how would she know that you're even interested in her? And they, my clients always have these mind-blowing breakthroughs and they're like, whoa, Sarah, I had no idea I was doing that. I had no idea that that, like, when I tried to pay her a compliment, that's how it came out. So now mm. they're, they're re really not just raising their awareness, but they're getting control back of how they want to lead, how they want to communicate on their dates. And now being recorded mm. in a safe and healthy way, <laughs> rather than being in the bushes... <laughs> Everyone is aware and gives full consent for the recording, you know. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> How would you go with a, with a virtual date like that, Luke? I'd be interested. Like, mm. I, I think that's actually such good practice. Yeah. Is anyone else doing this? Well, I used to do sales for another company and they had, you know, the industry calls them mock dates. So usually, yeah, you just get a date with a model and – uh, you know, I used to break them down for another company that I was doing sales for. So it is out there, but it's not its not really known. Like it's not very well known in the mm. industry. So I really want to be part of making it more well known. It's like not something that we need to hide. It's actually such an incredible tool to help create much healthier interactions between daters. For sure. You're just getting experience. Yeah. So then when you do the real thing, you feel more prepared. It's just like Toastmasters. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so how do you help guys flirt? Like what sort mm. of things do you actually – is it just like simple looks, touches, like I don't know, like kind of brushing the shoulder, lay it on us. Brushing the shoulder. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the biggest one for – like, there's so many ways you can flirt. Like there's just – 
it's so much fun and that's the real message. Well, it's uh, just creative. It's playful. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. Being, yeah, being flirty is being creative and being yes. playful in general. Which is really hard because for a lot of guys, maybe you would relate when you weren't as confident yes. and you'd get stuck and think, what should I say next? Uh, uh, now I've been thinking about it for too long. So like the biggest thing that I start with usually is telling my client to slow down. It's not a race. You want to get present. And when you slow down, if you're intentionally slowing things down and creating space, that's when flirting can usually flourish and sexual tension can build, which is... Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and right at that high point. I know, which again is something that a lot of guys feel uncomfortable with to begin with. Sure. We've all been in a situation where there's an awkward silence and you look away from each other and you're just like, oh... God, what do we do now? They can be some of the most incredible moments that really shape your whole relationship together. You look back and go, oh, how funny was it on our first date when you spilt your drink all over your pants? So like knowing how to keep your cool as a man in those moments that, yeah, they are awkward, but the goal is not to avoid awkward moments. The goal is to feel comfortable in those moments and know how to handle them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, look, there's lots of things and it really depends on each individual guy going through it. But some of the big ones is slowing things down, complimenting her beyond her looks, yeah. um, talking about topics of sex and intimacy on your first dates. That okay. is a that is a big one, <clears throat> if I'm being quite honest. Like as soon as soon as you can really talk about intimacy in a non-sexual way. So like f- the practice of flirting without needing it to go to anything sexual. That's when you start to enjoy flirting more. And women are really quite good at that usually. We love to flirt and not yeah, really expect something. comes out a lot more natural generally. Yeah, yeah. whereas a guy's like, well, she's flirting with me. That must mean that she yeah. wants to go home with me. It's like, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, spot on. That's a game changer. That's yeah. sick. So what sort of transformations have you seen? So a lot of guys will get a girlfriend during doing the course with me. Uh, and it's always really exciting, you know, where they, they're usually the guys that apply themselves and they're just super curious and throw themselves in the deep end. And yeah, they're, they're going on dates regularly. They're finding out what they want, what they don't want. Mm. And they're having fun. The men that are out there having fun, tackling the emotions, they usually find themselves attracting more women and therefore getting into relationships. For sure. As a coach, like that's not my goal to go, okay, a client's successful but if he gets into a relationship. To me, their success can be simply getting the confidence and the ability to be able to approach anyone that they see. That to me is huge as well. Mm. So I, I don't like to put pressure on me or them to go, oh, well, you've got to meet a woman in the next like three months. <laughs> Time's ticking. <laughs> you've got two months. Otherwise, you're kicked out of our dating academy. <laughs> yeah, so um, – they're the kind of transformations though, like inevitably when you apply yourself, you build more confidence, you have like, you, you get more friends because you learn how to be social and yeah, your self-esteem skyrockets because you're like, yeah, I can be myself and I can talk about these topics that I've noticed for a lot of guys, the intimacy thing for some reason gets like the door gets closed when they're like adolescents or something, you know, they're just in those formative years and they think, oh, it's just respectful to talk about this with a woman. Mm. I shouldn't flirt with a woman. That's creepy. I don't want to make her feel uncomfortable. So that really comes through. Sorry, buddy. Do you feel societies having an effect in that way? Because I feel like men are getting a bit of a bad rap of like toxic masculinity and you can't like flirt or approach women and it's almost like maybe guys feel a little bit scared to do that or like how am I going to be seen? Am I going to be seen as like a predator? Like just like approaching a woman just trying to open have a conversation? Yeah, that definitely plays a, a huge role in why men don't work on this area or don't want to approach a woman because they don't want to be that guy. The thing I always say is like you'll never be that guy if you've got really good intentions. Of course. If you've got bad intentions, okay, yeah, you probably are a predator and you're being creepy. Like don't do that. But if you reset or reframe like the intention and you are you know you're going to make that person's night or you're just here and you want to meet new people, it comes from a completely different energy. And I feel like that's a great way to combat those thoughts or stories that society might be putting onto you. You don't have to believe them. You don't have to subscribe to any of that. And, you know, 
reframing it as the best tool in your kit. If you can just work out, what am I telling myself? What am I believing about dating, believing about flirting and why I do it or don't do it and how I do it and how can I do it differently? Mm -hmm. And then just like leaning into that and learning. It's like anything. You're not going to be great when you start doing it. You're going to pull out all the horrible pickup lines or like just, why did you say that? Why? Like, where did that? <laughs> yes. What was that? And then you're going to get better. <laughs> yeah, the face palm moment the next day, and you're like, Fuck, did I say that? Like, wh- why did I say that? That was so bad. Yeah. yeah. And then you, and then you never do it again. You learn from it. You'd be like, I'm not going to make that mistake again. Yeah, it's hilarious. Yep. How do guys open? You talked about that. Like, I feel there's an art form to it. Mm. Sometimes you can get it right. Sometimes you can just maybe like just maybe approach it in the wrong way and it just doesn't really work out. But are there any tips that you would give guys to just opening a conversation or approaching someone? Yeah, just to get it going. Yeah, look, I feel like using your environment will really help you. It won't feel as daunting because it's just something that you're both experiencing. So you could be in the same bar or the same cafe or something like that. And they're having a coffee and it just makes logical sense to say, oh, like that looks good. What is it? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's not it's not showing and it's not a pickup line per se, uh, but it's just simple. It's authentic. It's direct. It makes sense. So I feel like it's a way to calm your nervous system as a guy and don't you don't have to perform like a peacock. Like it's okay. You don't need to show your feathers and like have them glisten in the sun to open a conversation, to start something with someone. Uh, So I like to strip it all back and keep it really simple Mm -hmm. and remove all of that pressure. Uh, When you feel good, it's a lot easier. So I also say to the guys, get yourself into a great state physiologically and psychologically before you walk out the front door. Mm -hmm. Spot on. Like I know it sounds corny, but I used to do this every time we would start a boot camp, which, which is what these events were called, boot camps, when we would go out to the streets just high five 20 people on your way to the venue. Like it sounds ridiculous, but it just gets you into your body and out of your head. Like who cares? Like stop taking life too seriously. Then what happens is you start to feel better and you start to give less shits and you just walk up to people. I think one of the biggest mistakes guys make is they put a woman on a pedestal, like a gorgeous woman that they just look at like, oh my goodness, she's an angel. It's like she's not human. She's just like you and me. She's just the same. So, you know, bringing it back to planet Earth and actually going, do you know what? I'm going to treat her the same as I treat everybody else. And it will remove a lot of the pressure that you're putting on yourself too. Yeah, that seems to be something that makes people super successful in this space when they're not scared of just any of that and don't put anyone on the pedestal and just start conversations without even any agenda and then just if it goes somewhere great if not i just had a conversation with a fellow human and we had a good little (laughs) three minute powwow and then we moved on with our lives and that was all sweet too yeah i feel like a lot of guys are afraid to have different outcomes to when they go up to a woman like if they think well i'm interested in her romantically and if that outcome doesn't come from it they're disappointed rather than adapting in the moment and converting it into something else Mm. maybe like Uh, maybe invite her into your group and introduce her to somebody else. Being able to detach yourself from the outcome is a really powerful, uh, you know, part of attraction. She'll probably end up wanting you at the end of it anyway. That's, yeah, yeah, that's the truth of it. Yeah. yeah, That's a really good point. What about the dating apps? I mean, Mm. really interesting. We can go down a rabbit hole right here. They've changed the game. They're really interesting. Love, hate relationship. You, you're on a dating app and you're like, Oh, this is awesome. And then you're like, no, I just, I want (laughs) to, I want to throw this in the bin. So what is your advice and what is your take on the dating apps and how can we use it better Mm. in a more intentional way that's going to yield better results, better connections, Mm. um, and just, yeah, meet the right people that you want to meet? Mm. I think we're all guilty of downloading and then Mm -hmm. deleting and then downloading dating apps. And to be honest with you, they're quite disheartening, a lot of them, especially the ones that have become, you know, big fish in the industry. They're geared towards making money rather than for the dating experience and for the data to have success. Because if you stay on the app, they're going to keep making money from you. You know, I, I get that that's like a big call, but even being a dating coach, I really don't like dating apps. Mm. I think they, 
they give you a very false understanding of what's even out there as well. And I've seen guys like this one guy I work with was just so fixated on understanding the the whole analytics of it and how he could get better results. And I was like, dude, you, you've got to have a break. Like delete the Excel spreadsheet on this. <laughs> like I'm telling you, this is not healthy because you, yeah. <laughs> you're never going to beat the gambling machine. It's just not going to work. Yeah. Not in that way at least. And so I'm actually working on a, a project at the moment called Date With Us, which okay. we – We believe that the future of modern dating, especially with dating apps, to use them in a more authentic way is through video instead of photos because photos are so one-dimensional. And frankly, people aren't great at taking photos. Both men and women like this. I'm sorry. You know, you get on. It's pretty horrific. If you get on and have a look at what we're dealing with, it's not good from both sides of the fence there. So me and my business partner were like, we want to empower the data and showcase their most authentic self. So part of what we do is actually interview you, ask you certain questions to, to uncover really quirky things about you and mm-hmm. what you're really looking for. Then we optimize them for dating apps. And then you have a video uh, profile instead of a photo-based profile. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, it's wild because people, you know, my experience is like, whoa, I can really connect with that person a lot faster and you can tell whether you've got compatibility with them. Yeah. yeah. Spot on. No, nah, big fan, big fan, because uh, I've always challenged myself when I've been on Hinge, for example, to have a video and have mm. a voice memo yep. just to put myself out there. Um, and it f- I feel like it actually does draw more authentic matches yep. more of the time when I do put myself out there and then pose certain photos that show, uh, I guess, the essence of who I am in mm-hmm. certain ways of this part of my life or this part of my life here, or just like good quality shots on film. And you kind of get a real, um, if it's done well, like a real feel of like, you don't know this person, but you can actually get a real sense of, Oh, like, I feel like they're like this. Yes. If, if it's done well. And then when that's reciprocated with someone on the other end, you can actually go on an awesome day, which, mm. I, which I've had a few, ex- few experiences with. And it's been so fun. Had a great yeah. time. Yeah. I feel like would you utilize voice notes once you're actually texting? Yeah, I'm a big voice note yeah. guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love it or hate it. Nah, it's 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 a, it's efficient. I love getting my voice out there if you haven't heard um, with this podcast 14 <laughs> episodes in. Yeah. So I yeah, I don't mind it and I yeah. just enjoy it and I feel like you can actually have like just a sick conversation. You with can someone. you can have a lot less miscommunication through sending voice notes and getting on a phone call. I know it's scary. I know it's scary. <laughs> but if you got on a phone call, you could kind of work out whether you'd want to go and see this person in on an actual date or yeah. not in like five minutes. It's it's actually a really good point. I mean, for me, I'm a very career-driven, focused person that I've only started dating and getting into these experiences in the last couple of years. My career and what I do in that space is is number one. So I don't give too much time to other things. If I want to date, I want to do it efficiently. So I want to find out whether it's going to be a waste of my time or, or not. So I'll just throw out just stuff about myself just as a little test. Yeah. See, are they going to bite on that or um, are they just going to leave? If I, if I just like try to chuck in a little phone call, are they mm. going to squirm or are they going to like I actually go for it? And, it and, and then I'll know straight away because I don't, I don't care either way. I don't mind. Like I'm, I'm either – gonna go on this day or i'm just gonna keep doing what i do with my day and my career and i love that too and if i don't go on a date i don't care yeah because i love what i do yes and and this is the thing busy people that have stuff going on they they do value efficiency with dating and as a woman i have saved so much time and energy that i could have wasted by going on a three-hour date with someone through a five ten minute conversation with them and kind of go "Mm." You know, I'm not really aligning, you know, we don't have the same sense of humor. It's not really, you know, I won't get my makeup and get dressed and go and meet them and have dinner. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, it's like then you're not spending money, you know, paying for a dinner or something like that All as well. That, yeah. yeah. So I agree. I think you've got the right uh, mindset and attitude towards it. <laughs> <laughs> it's important. You've got to be efficient. I mean... Uh, Not too efficient. You know, you don't yeah. want to take the romance out of it. No, <laughs> no. Nah, nah. I'm a big romantic guy anyway, so that, that's all. that's all sweet. Where are you wanting to take all of this? I mean, you, you just spoke about just creating this new, this new app, new way of dating, but are you fully invested in this space? Where are you wanting to go with it? Yeah, I'm 
just more and more passionate about it I'm noticing like every year that I continue to focus on this it starts to build and you know I've started some things in my life and stopped them you know with sport I feel like people can relate to that you start something as a kid and then you, you stop doing it and so this is something that I've found on my own and if I feel very powerful in just like taking responsibility for that. And it's something that I love. Like I've always been so curious about people. I get to help people every day. And in something that I find to be a little bit taboo, which I also like, I like that it is. I like that people squirm a little bit when you bring up dating around the dinner table. And Mm -hmm. my mission is to change that cringy reaction that we always get when it comes up around the table or dating apps suck. I really want to change the game Mm -hmm. and actually inspire people to realize that you can have fun dating and to play a big role in matching a lot more people up Mm -hmm. to help them find love in this world because... Yeah, I just think on the dating apps, like there's over 300 million dating users, but are they really being showcased in the right way? What if they had the skills to showcase themselves and they had the skill to go out into their life and to create a lifestyle where they're going to meet these people and then they know how to develop those healthy relationships? Mm. Yeah. Mad respect. Mad respect for anyone that wants to actually have the conversation about things that can be a little bit uncomfortable mm. and just make them more just normal. I yes. think that's really, really important, whether it's with emotions or dating for like, just two examples, just to be able to have that conversation about it's It's not, I don't know why we've made it so taboo. It's just, it's just human experience and human interaction. Yeah. I always get that response, like a dating coach. What do you, what does that do? Mm. Like it's like, wow, <laughs> the, the day when the world, the world is a lot more open to yeah. realizing that you're not a failure as a man if you get a dating coach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, uh, but the response at the moment is like, oh, you know, I don't need that. They're usually the men that need the dating coach, yeah. you know, and I think that there's this stigma around yeah. uh, the dating world where, oh, you must be a guy that's never been on a date if you have a dating coach. But most of my clients are successful business guys, whether they run their own com- like company or they're doing very well for themselves and they want to build their confidence and understand women on a deeper level. Yeah. I feel like those sort of people actually investing in themselves and their personal growth because they yep. actually see the value of if I get better in this space, I'm going to become a better communicator. It's actually going to help me with my business. And they yep. see the ripple of how it's actually going to all affect all in their life. So it's not like a, I need to do this just for dating. They see so much more value in that, which I think a lot of people kind of miss Mm. the point of it's not actually physically about the date. It's, it's much more than that. Like, can I actually become a better listener? Can I become a better communicator? Can I actually then hopefully have better relationship with my mum and my dad, for example, Mm. as a result of this, like you don't necessarily know how much it affects everything else in your life. Yeah. You're spot on. So many of my sales guys, uh, not my sales guys, but like the men that work in sales, they always say that their calls after doing work with me improve like tenfold. They're like, whoa, Sarah. And it, you know, it's almost like flirting with your prospect in a way. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be in a sexual, like, yeah, it can just be charming. Exactly. And that's, yeah. that's, it's a form of communication that is really powerful. Mm, I think in the world that we're moving into, this has become, it, this is. I think the most important thing that people need to tap into, Mm. not necessarily like from a dating perspective of just understanding human behavior, understanding how to interact and be adaptable in your behavior. I mean, we touched on acting Mm. early on and just having some simple skills and tools that are going to help you navigate just the real uncertain world that we're heading into, which you don't necessarily know how it's going to be in 10, 15 years because there's so much change, especially with technology that, yeah, I think people who have this are always going to be sweet. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the greatest skills that I ever learned and continue to be a student of is communication. It's really powerful. Mm. Like when you learn how to do that, you know, that's how I got into this space in the first place is networking. That's how I've got most of my jobs in my life is simply through networking and understanding how to adapt to different situations, yeah. different environments. It makes life a bit more playful and like a game like every yeah. single day you get excited by like can i have a really cool conversation with some random person yeah just at the shop ordering coffee can i actually turn this into something not because i want to date this person but just because just because like well, let's, let's mean, play the game a little bit even the way that you and i met like yes. it was totally random you know but again it requires people to be open to having a chat and yeah to 
allow other people into their world instead of closing them out, you know? And we wouldn't be here sitting here doing this podcast if it wasn't for that. Yes, all of that. Mad respect. <laughs> Big fan of your work, Sarah. So where to from here? I mean, I, I want to um, – we've had such an awesome conversation. Just to, just to kind of close, is there anything that you feel like you're really wanting to tap tap into in the next, let's say, five years' time where you really want to go with your life in dating, in this dating world, not even in the dating world, just anything in general? Yeah, I feel like my two loves are this, my coaching business and acting. I would really love to delve more into that. I feel like there's a space for more – communities to uh, have acting available. I feel like, yes, there's schools and things like that, but there's not as many groups where you can like go and do your acting training. And I just love that. I wish there was more of that, Um, not just in Adelaide, but around Australia and abroad. So that's one part that's always in the back of my mind. And then the main thing for me is building my company and expanding it, getting assistant coaches and more uh, women on the team and men on the team and be able to service, you know, both men and women. Uh, I think that would be a real dream and to get back on tour in a different way. So my own version of what I did when I started, but coming from Sarah and like her power and how she wants to do it. Amazing. For anyone that's listening that is going like, oh, I like what Sarah's about and I want to maybe tap into this dating world. What's the best place to get connected with you? Slide into my DMs on Instagram Mm -hmm. at uh, dating with Sarah official. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I've got my other one as well at Sarah Givons, but that's my coaching one. So that's probably the best way to yeah, get nice. in contact with me. Awesome. So good. Such a fun conversation. Really glad we did this. And um, yeah, appreciate your work. And I feel like you're adding so much value to the world. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me on.